Um, so thank you, Jaime, for the invitation to come and share our work with you in Galapagos. Um, as Jaime said, I'm Renu and I work with the Helmsley Charitable Trust. Um, so just to get started, I wanted to share um, a video from National Geographics on the Galapagos. It is a project that we funded called Pristine Seas. And I think it'll give you an opportunity to really see how amazing the Galapagos is. Las Islas Galapagos son un patrimonio natural de la humanidad y uno de los destinos de turismo de naturaleza más famosos del mundo. de tiburones más grande del planeta. El valor turístico de un tiburón en Galápagos a lo largo de su vida es de más de 5 millones de dólares. Si se pesca, solo produce 200. Um, as we get started, one thing I want to say, I really would like this to be a discussion, so feel free to interrupt me, ask me questions. Um, I don't want to talk at you, I'd like to talk about it. Um, so it's, this is a really high level discussion, so just ask me questions and we can dig deeper. Um, so as you know, the Galapagos are located 600 miles west of mainland Ecuador. It um, has a population estimated around 30,000 people over four islands that are inhabited out of 11 islands total. Um, and as part of that, only 3% of these islands are allowed to be developed for a human population. The other 97% is protected by and managed by the Na Galapagos National Park. Um, and then annually, the visitor count is about 225,000. So 67% foreign visitors, 33% national. Yeah. So the 67, 33, uh -huh. that seems very... You know, one third, two thirds. Yeah. Is that by design then? No, it just no. seems to be following a pattern. I mean, the last few years have kind of stayed consistently about this pop, this um, um, number of tourists, and it always seems to kind of sit that two thirds, one third. Um, I don't think they've done a study to figure out why the reason is. There's definitely there's a difference in you know you pay a park fee to enter into Galapagos. Um, foreign foreigners pay a hundred dollars. Nationals pay twenty dollars, I believe. Uh, so. Um, it, there's there's never been a reason why that I've understood. What makes um, Galapagos so unique is that it sits um, on a confluence of three ocean currents, and this um, these currents bring in nutrient rich waters, and because of that, then it becomes a feeding ground for many pelagic species that are migrating through this region. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but. Um, 
So you end up having species such as sharks, whales, um, tuna that come through. So you can see from this map um, the migration patterns of um, pelagic species coming from Mexico, Costa Rica, um, and um, coming through Galapagos and going down as far south as Peru. Um, so this makes for um, a really good discussion around opportunities around multilateral and bilateral um, um, agreements. <clears throat> so what's also important is that Galapagos has roughly 80% of land birds, 97% of reptiles, and land mammals that are found nowhere else in the world. They're end endemic to Galapagos. So you can see here a picture of a marine iguana, the only liz uh, lizard that's known to swim in the ocean. Um, and in 1978, UNESCO uh, designated Galapagos as the first world heritage site, and then later um, in 1998 um, designated the marine um, reserve as a World Heritage Site. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our funding strategy and our approach. Um, we began, Helmsley began funding in Galapagos in 2009. We are one of the main funders in the region. And to date, we've committed about $33 million. Um, and our goal is to build the capacity and strength in the management in the Galapagos, so to protect our the biodiversity and ensure long-term sustainability. Um, and some of our strategies include sustainable tourism, environmental education, fisheries management, urban planning. So it sounds like we're kind of on this whole array of different things that we fund, but I'll talk about kind of how we got there and kind of this, this logic model that, as a tool that we use to monitor our funding. So basically, we spent a few um, trips down to Galapagos to do scoping trips, to meet with stakeholders, talk to non-governmental organizations, governmental organization experts in the field, and really try to understand what's going on. What are the priori priorities of the government? What would they? What you know? What do they need in order to ensure a long-term sustainability plan for Galapagos? And so, some of the things that you'll see here that we fund include um, like the development and commercialization of the local industry. So one thing that happens is that we try to fund um, livelihood projects around agriculture and then also on being able to source um, building materials locally rather than bringing it in um, from mainland. And the point to do that is that when you're bringing, you're building livelihoods on island, but you're also um, reducing the risk of non-invasive species coming to the islands through cargo, which is one of the biggest threats for all island nations is invasive species. Um, we invest in environmental education, and part of that is to promote behavior change. And so we fund, um, we fund young groups, we fund um, programs that socialize, socialize some of our conservation programs with the adults, and the idea, again, is that in order to really have a long-term impact, you have to have behavior change. You have to see people understanding why is it important to them as a livelihood, as well-being, in order to, to um, conserve the, the space around them. And don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, I think for years, people in Galapagos have been told that they can't do this, and they can't do this, and they can't do this, and they're jaded by conservation. They're jaded by the whole discussion around it. So the communication has to change. It's like, how do you, how do me, how do I benefit from conserving the land around me? Like, do I get a job? Does it help my children go to school? Does it, what, what does it do for me? So these are things that we've also learned through time is how do you communicate this and how do you approach it in a way where not only is it just conserving land, but you're also helping the people. So one of the things in all the geographies that we work in is that we take a holistic approach, as you can tell. And we try to integrate the human well-being while also um, conserving the environment around us. Mm -hmm. um, Helmsy's been there since 2009. I've been there for almost four years. So what has? What has? Are you succeeding in that? We have. I'll... I'll talk about some of those, um, um, some of the things that we've succeeded at. But yeah, you do see movement. A lot of it, I think, has to do with the approach that we take. I mean, we're not typical funders. We really, we work really hard with building relationships with our partners on the ground. So we work with all the government agencies. We work with all the NGOs. We identify the different players um, um, in the space and really try to understand what is it, what is the agenda? What is what is this Galapagos National Park director really trying to achieve, and how do we help them get there? But you know, what is the the 
the governor of the um, Galapagos Governing Council, what is he trying to achieve? They're on, they're two different agencies, have two different um, ways that they have to report to the president or to the environmental minister, but they all have their, these power struggles that happen. So how can we mediate from that, from the background? How can we empower the champions in the community and the champions in these NGOs? So you know we we've done that through eradication projects where we've been able to succeed we've done we rezoning of the Galapagos Marine Reserve and all this I'll talk about a little bit later on but you start to see movement but I think the movement happens because we're we're slowly kind of we're leading from behind if possible so as I mentioned some of the things that we learned through our visits there are some of the major threats. And as I mentioned, introduction of invasive species. Major problem for biodiversity and, and a big problem for um, island nations. Um, increase in residents and tourism, uh, tourists. Um, so when we've done carrying capacity studies to really understand what is the number of residents that the islands can sustain and what are the number of tourists that the island can, su can sustain. You, you kind of get into this conflict because you have the tourism industry. They want to increase tourism because they want more money. And then you have residents at, that keep coming to the island. And the main reason why is that the, there's basic skill sets that aren't found on the island. You don't have electricians. You don't have construction workers. You don't have um, plumbers. And so a lot of people come to the island for what's supposed to be six months to do these, um, these uh, um, jobs, but they never leave. So you continuously have this unsustainable development on the islands that's happening. So slowly, some of the, some funding that we've done is we've worked with the governing council to really help them build up the technology so they can monitor the people mo going, the movement of people in and out of the islands, um, and finding ways to also develop sustainably more urban planning techniques and working with the municipalities. And then finally, illegal and unsustainable fishing, which is a problem not just in Galapagos, but globally, and this is something that we're working with many of the fisher communities to deal with. Um, and then what are the drivers? So a lot of it is government capacity and turnover. Um, you know, the, this president is, he likes to change his ministry a lot. So he's always, you have changes of minister sometimes, you know, three, four times a year. And when that happens, you have new park directors that come in. You have new staff people it completely revamps the entire, all the institutions that we've been working with. And you may have a new um, director for um, the park or the governing council, and they may have no whatsoever trust for the NGO community. And when that happens, doors shut. And that's, we've, we, we went through that for about a year and a half. And we just had to stay patient and keep working where we could and find ways to work around it. But once the door is open, we, we ride that wave and we try to pump money in to say, okay, well, how can we keep this, keep our work moving? How can we work those relationships? But some of the other things we've learned too is that um, we've learned how to build the relationships with the government institutions, but we've also learned to develop MOUs. So by developing the MOUs, the government, the, the NGOs and the other people, other communities can keep working on the projects that they have. But if the change, if there's change in directors or staff, that MOU sets it in that those activities won't change and we don't lose momentum. And it's something that was never set up for, before. So we've been trying to do that more often. Um, and also no financial resources are low. I mean, with oil prices dropping, and Ecuador is highly dependent on oil, and all the government agencies, were, their budgets were cut. And so this is where private funding comes in to fill that gap. But um, private funding can't fill such big gaps like that. And so you have to be resourceful. You have to really learn how to prioritize what projects need to keep going so you don't lose momentum. Um, so a great example of a group that we work with is Wild Aid. Um, Wild Aid has been <coughs> in Galapagos for probably 10 to 15 years, and they've been working with the biosecurity agency in, in really building up this institution, um, training their staff, um, building uh, um, onboarding books, um, training guides, so that when staff changes over, the momentum isn't lost. They have a resource to use to, 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 to get up to speed on their activities. They um, have funded dogs to come in um, to, um, to sniff out invasive species, such as giant land snails. Um, and they've also worked with um, the Galapagos National Park. And they've worked on helping them monitor the movement of fishing vessels and tourism boats. And what they've done is they've installed satellite equipment on the boats um, and um, 
for, so the park and navy and set up technology so the park and navy can monitor the movement of these boats real time throughout the marine reserve so um, basically if um, you by just by watching the movement of uh, fishing boats, you can tell what type of fishing they're doing. If they're doing illegal fishing, such as long lining, then the, the Navy can send out enforcement to stop that kind of activity. You can also see if boats are entering the Marine Reserve illegally without permits, and they can send out um, enforcement. But one of the first things that gets cut when, when, budget, when there's budget cuts is being able to monitor, being able to actually send out enforcement. So political perspective. So what's really interesting about Galapagos is that you have a number of agencies that all have their hands in the pot to really manage what's happening in Galapagos. But the problem is um, a lot of these agencies are actually in mainland. So what they don't understand is how um, what they don't understand is how what the priorities are for an island nation and what. Um, you know what they you know they're putting in regulations that actually undermine some of the activities that are happening on the island because they're so disconnected on what's going on. The other thing that happens is so you you know in the case of this you have Ministry of Tourism that's completely on mainland um, reports directly to the president. He wants to increase tourism, but he doesn't speak to the Minister of Tour Environment to really understand what's what would happen if you do that that you are jeopardizing the biodiversity in this region. So, you know, you have these power struggles that should start to happen. You have the Galapagos Biosecurity Agency and the Galapagos National Park that report to the Ministry of Environment. Um, but they're in charge of manage, managing the Marine Reserve, um, managing how movement of cargo is happening. Um, but then you, over here, you have the Governing Council of Galapagos. And they kind of stay, have this role where they oversee everything. So they do work with the fisher communities. They also work in the Marine Reserve. But he reports directly to the president. So you, you kind of see all these power struggles that start to happen. And so our role is to see if that, by working with these different agencies, if we can also sit in the background and help mediate, understanding the conflicts and figure out if we can, you know, find a way to work around them without actually causing the conflicts to heat up even further. So that's something that I think in, in regards to wishing some of our successes we've been able to do because we do do that as a, as a, as a culture of our foundation. So some of our successes. Um, so uh, we, a few years ago, funded an eradication project on two uninhabited islands known as Rabida and Pinzon. And because of the eradication, it was eradication of a non-invasive um, of non-invasive species of rats. Sorry, of invasive species, rats. Um, and so through that process, there was a discovery of a new species of land snail, rediscovery of a lizard that was thought to have gone extinct, um, recovery of the fauna and flora, and you usually can see that within two to three years. You'll start seeing chain, you know, you'll start seeing bird species returning because these rats feed on the eggs of many bird populations. They feed on lizards, um, and so within within a when, within two to three years, you can actually see the recovery of um, these projects. So, really, one of the things that's really great about eradication projects is that you really it's a, it's kind of a beginning end, and that's it. You really do see. Um, the benefits of it. And more importantly, I think the community started to see the benefits of it and how um, understanding the, the role that invasive species has on the islands and how detrimental it is, how important it is to work with um, the biosecurity agencies and the parks to prevent them from coming to the islands. Um, another really great success that just happened this past March was the rezoning the Galapagos Marine Reserve. Um, so this was something that was about two, two and a half years of um, NGOs, the Galapagos National Park, um, scientists working together to really find the best solution to rezone um, the marine reserve. And what you see is that, I mean, if you can see it, like these boats that sit on the edge of the marine reserve. And then you have tourism boats that are all around the island. Um, and, but, and then you have fishing boats within it. And what's happening is that there's no... There's no, no, what we say, no take zones or zones that allow the habitat to recover and to um, have what we call a spillover effect. So if um, you make an area a no take zone it's, and it's a highly um, productive area, ideally the fish in that area will start to produce some spillover and then the fishermen can actually benefit from it. Um, none of those were designated. One, when the marine reserves, marine reserves first established, they didn't have the science to do that. They didn't have the tools to do that. 
They didn't have best practices to do that. So they used a tool called Sea Sketch, which is which is a marine spatial planning tool, and that allowed them to do what they called a trade-off analysis. So it was just layers and layers of data. So they would speak with the the fisher communities to understand, you know, what is their priority regions for fishing. They would speak to the tourism industry to understand what's really important for them for their tourists. They would speak to other stakeholders, you know, whether it be you know having to compromise with um, drilling or you know drilling industry and um, you know other groups like that, and really trying to understand, okay, where can we um, establish these no-take zones? And you can see on the map before, they'll put like, they'll just draw different little polygons, different scenarios, and then they have these trade-off analysis that if we put it here, then only the fisher community is going to benefit, but then the biodiversity is not going to benefit. So you go through this, and it, took, it takes years to go through this process, but what you come up with is a win-win. So the fisher community was part of the discussion at all times, and they understand that if they um, they don't if they don't fish in these regions, then you have an opportunity to um, benefit even further. Um, tourism industry also sees that you know if there's more fish, there's more tourists that want to come and go go diving, and so it's just kind of, it's a win-win all around. Um, and it also you know through this process and as years continue, you know, the Galapagos National Park. We'll continue to use these tools. They have, a, you know, we've increased the capacity of these um, organizations to be able to use this. Uh, also, what's happened is um, groups like Wild Ape have improved the surveillance and monitoring um, in these regions and being able to actually have enforcement. So another layer that was put on this that, you know, if you kind of congregate where the no take zones are, then you have less you have less area to actually have to um, send enforcement out if someone's um, have entering in these areas. Um, another great thing that really came out of this um, was that um, in the north um, region, um, and you saw from the, the video of the, that beautiful site of Darwin and Wolf, that was completely named, um, marked off as a whale sanctuary, as a, sorry, as a shark sanctuary. So no industrial boats, no fishing vessels, no tourism boats can enter that site anymore. Um, and the reason why is because of the high biomass congregation of sharks in that region. Um, so opportunities. Um, I think what's really interesting to um, understand is that, you know, I showed you this map before, and just by looking at this, and you see the movement and patterns of pelagic species moving across the entire eastern tropical Pacific. What's really fascinating here is that if you if you really sat down and you were able to sit with the different countries, the bilateral and multilateral agreements that could come out of this, this is something that we slowly start working on. And you know what you could do is also speak with industrial fishing um, companies and say, look, you know, do not fish in these areas during this time. Do not, um, do, you know, the movement of industrial fishing boats. The you know having a kind of a a move a kind of a you could say like a a marine protected area that's constantly migrating based on where the movement of food sources or fish or, or pelagic species are moving. So there's all these opportunities that only, and by doing that, you're, the, the benefits are not just um, the fishing community or the, but it's the government, it's the habitat, it's long-term food security, health benefits. So you just, it, there's just so many opportunities here that we hope, you know, in the future, whether it's Helmsy or somebody else, that they take advantage of this. Um, another thing that there's no slide, but um, I just wanted to talk about is that uh, carrying capacity. There's many studies that have been done understanding what, how the tourism um, industry is impacting Galapagos. It's changing the park fees, the park fees that are used to manage these biosecurity agencies and um, the national park. If, if those change, if those increase, and there's studies shown that if you increase it to $330, it wouldn't change the number of tourists coming to that region. Um, it would probably limit it, and, but it wouldn't. You wouldn't have a reduction. So you'd have more resources coming in to manage these resources, but you wouldn't hurt the livelihoods of the communities in these regions. So these are just like a few opportunities that we've identified and things that you know. As you guys think about what you want to look at or in other regions, these are things that you should really consider and talk with others about. And. With that, thank you.